Hello, everybody. I'm so excited to be bringing to you this episode of Starseed Mission Support. We are going live with our beautiful sister, Sonia Rose, who is a true sky astrologer I recently met through our sister, Grace, on her podcast, The Oracle Codex. And honestly, myself, the only experience that I have had with astrology has been with galactic astrology. And the reason is that is because I was born with a super sensitive meter for purity in things that I'm allowed to engage in. And so it's like this natural gravitational field where unless something gets brought into my life through synchronicity or through an experience that just piques my curiosity or just pulls my soul um, magnetically, um, I kind of steer clear of different things and, and allow my heart and my intelligence to guide me and lead me in that way. And so back in 2015, I began to notice that during certain times during the year, I would feel this cosmic energy open up and my cranium would open. I would feel these cosmic energies begin to radiate through the earth. And over the years, I noticed that it would be the same time every year that these stellar activations would happen. And then I discovered the work of Graham Forscott, who was a galactic astrologer. And I discovered that a lot of these major times when I experienced these synchronicities, you know, connected to the Pleiades and Andromeda, these are actually real life, true alignments to the cosmos. So when the earth, the sun, and these stellar bodies come into actual alignment, there's an energetic shift that happens that we can experience with our organic biology. And this is kind of where it's taken me is tracking my body's natural connection with the earth and its connection to the cosmic alignments and really tracking this organic experience through time, which I really believe was how our ancestors began working with the stars and the star maps to begin with, because there were physical, visceral experiences that are organic to our experience as we were tracking the movements of these energies of these stellar bodies. And so this is why when I discovered Sonia's work, um, by the way, I was never really attracted to true sky astrology because I was really attached to being a Cancer and I was really resistant to being a Gemini because I had these like ideas i guess of what gemini is and i was like oh like gemini suck and i <laughs> you know i don't want to be a gemini and so for many years i would see things about true sky and i just almost scoff at it but then you know i never really was called to get any sort of tropical readings either just never found an astrologer that like i really resonated and i've had all sorts of readings in the akash and the galactic astrology so i only do it when i really feel like a soul spark connection to a person right because you know they're accessing your soul's records and they're reading your soul's energy and so who is reading your chart i feel like is so so important because the reader is going to read you from the angle that they're looking at you from and that's just really it's like a spell casting almost is so important and so when i first listened to sonia's podcast episode it was the first time where i was like whoa there's like a kind of talk about astrology that's actually really resonating with me on a deep soul level and then I got a session with her and it was actually like the most extraordinary <laughs> session you know that I've ever had like it was so clear like she was just talking really fast which to me was like she was just really just knew her stuff so well and not only read the chart but really read I felt like she read my soul I feel like she wasn't just reading the mathematical equation that is a chart, but she was really reading how like and why a soul would put placements in that way, because that's really like the multidimensional aspect of astrology. Like it's not just math. We're not just these two dimensional mathematical beings. We have a spirit. We have a multidimensionality. So even if we were born at the exact same time, the same place as another soul and we had the exact same chart, the way that our soul put the chart together would be different. And it requires for a kind of a soul intelligence to be able to read a chart on that level. And I really mm -hmm. felt like Sonia was doing that. and was just blowing my freaking mind and telling me these things about 
Gemini that I was like, oh my God, I just never actually even understood what Gemini really is because in the false matrix, there's all of these lower, almost distorted frequencies of these signs um, mm. that aren't connected to our true galactic self. And so I wanted to preface this conversation because Sonia is gonna share different kinds of things that may be challenging for our mind. And I'm gonna share different things that might be challenging for our mind as well. And the way that we really want to approach this conversation is just from this like in, in inquisitive, curious place. And I guess it's a very Gemini trait, isn't it? <laughs> For me, I'm just curious about stuff. I just want to know. I just want to understand. I want to receive information that exists in the universe. I want to just taste it all. And there's this mind virus you know, in our world and we see it everywhere where it's like there's only one way things have to be. And if you don't agree with the way that my way is, then you're dumb and I get to strip you of your human decency and I get to just be really rude to you and no longer allow love to flow. And so, you know, I really want to approach this conversation with from the land where it's like, I'm not saying that true sky is the absolute true truth. I'm not even saying that it's something that you have to subscribe to at this time, right? Because it's just we're sharing this perspective. And if you can allow your mind to just taste this frequency that we're sharing, and allow this information to percolate through your mind and come to a conclusion that isn't based on ideology, I think it would be very progressive and helpful for us to actually explore the true root of astrology, which is really our personal relationship to the actual energy that are existing in the universe. And so without further ado, I just want to um, bring Sonia up and I would love for you to just um, share your uh, work and introduce yourself. Mm, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, you're so amazing. I think people are saying we're a little staticky or crackly. I'm not sure if we can do anything about that. It's probably my internet. I'm just in the mountains in Costa Rica. <laughs> You're completely clear for me. So I guess we'll just continue on. Um, wow, we're getting a lot of static. So lots of static, lots of energy, lots of transmission coming through right now. So I'm just kind of clearing the channel energetically a little bit. Um, I'm really grateful and honestly like honored to be able to give this perspective to the world because our, our ancestors for millennia connected to the heavenly bodies and the sky above, they didn't have TVs. They had the stars and the planets to look at and to gaze at. And it's how they oriented themselves. It's literally how they traveled, how they knew where they were going. And that's also how we can know where we are going collectively and personally, because our personal astrological chart, the, the map of our soul that we designed and chose for ourselves when we came to the planet at the exact time that we did, is also a picture of the macro situation that's happening all around us. So it really gives us this universal perspective. And the thing about astrology and especially true astrology that I love most is not everywhere on the planet. Is it winter going into spring or is it summer going into autumn or somewhere in the middle, but everywhere on the planet currently at this time, the sun is in Aquarius. So we're getting the solar rays of Aquarius is currently right in the crotch of Aquarius, a very juicy spot to be in the cosmos. I call it the kinky cosmos when that happens, when we have transits through the jewels of the different signs. And it's really powerful to connect to the true visible sky. And you know, Z, you're like, it's not the definitive truth. I've got Scorpio placements and I've got a Scorpio Mercury. So I would disagree. You know, there's, we can all agree on and see with our own eyes where the planets are and where the constellations are. If you know how to look for them, if you're not practiced and how to spot constellations, or you live in a city with a lot of light pollution, I would recommend getting an astronomy app. And this is where science and spirituality really get to marry and merge and they really become one is within the cosmos. So get an astronomy app like Starwalk 2. That's my favorite one. And go out and observe the sky and see if you can pick out constellations. Usually the Big Dipper is the easiest one to find in the sky or Orion. Orion's really visible right now, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. 
And from there, you can actually find planets and see where their placements are. And it's very difficult to disagree with something that your own eyes can see, because I believe that we're all cosmic artists. We are all here on this planet to have a relationship to the earth as a planet, but also to all of the planets in our solar system and all the stars in our solar system. And when we get to connect to and see that Jupiter is currently in Aries or that Saturn is currently in Aquarius, and we can see that with our own eyes, no one else can take that away from you. You don't need me. You don't need an astrologer to give you access to astrology and to cosmic wisdom and to universal knowing. All you need is your own eyes and your own vessel. And you can go talk to Jupiter, talk to Saturn, talk to Aquarius, talk to Gemini yourself and have a relationship yourself with those constellations and those star bodies and star guardians and start to experience what that means for you. So that's like the first and foremost thing that I have to say is go out and get Star Walk 2, look at the sky, see how it feels to actually connect to and see for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Go and see for yourself and it'll be a profound shift for you. And really there's no arguing. Once you can see it with your own eyes, you can just see that Western astrology is like a weird fake timeline that we'll talk about later. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not in disagreement agreeance with that. I feel like a lot of times when people say that, you know, oh, you know, the tropical astrology, it really resonates with me and all of these things. And I, I just want to validate that because of course the we're going to relate to it because we're existing in a, a matrix reality. And so we have been existing inside of that system for a long time. And there's going to be things that we relate to, even if they are not organic. And so being able to understand that there are so many different frequencies of realities coexisting on this complicated earth is how we can um, not get into this like duality, right or wrong, yes or no kind of place in the, in the meantime, in the current time. Because I feel like a lot of people that you know, most people are not able or not accessing consciousness beyond the sun. And we have to realize that when we are accessing our higher dimensional consciousness, our soul consciousness, there are these frequency fences in even the solar level that really keep us quarantined in this planetary and solar system reality so that we're, we're, we're trapped here, right? It's like this soul prison. And so to have that awareness puts everything into right context, where it's really not something that we need to fight about if, you know, if this is legit or if that's legit or if this is right or that is wrong. It's just they're all these interweaving, coexisting realities um, and understanding that there has been this soul prison and it has been distorting every single system on Earth makes it easier to gestate. I mean, for me, it was really easy to cognize this because I already know that they have super degraded the medical system and the education system and the and science you know I had somebody post on Facebook yesterday saying that they're in university for nutrition for PhD and they're t teaching them to stop eating butter and to actually eat vegetable oil like that's what they're teaching people in the system so it's like understanding that these mass systems have all been manipulated in that way it's really not hard to consider that maybe astrology being as mainstream as it is has been tempered with as well and what's interesting is that oftentimes a lot of people have a really hard time just validating that just accepting that and i think that more has to do with this cognitive dissonance people have to the false matrix being a thing to begin with than you know the astrology itself yeah and i mean with western astrology for those of us living in western countries um, in Eastern astrology, like Vedic astrology is more accurate. It's still not the visible sky, but it's m more accurate. And it's like less incorrect, I would say. But with Western astrology, it's something that we've had conditioned for us our whole lives since we were children, reading like funny magazines or books about our astrological chart. So many people have this identity crisis when it comes to learning about the true sky, because usually their sun sign does change. Mine shifted from being purely Scorpio to being Libra Scorpio cusp. And that was really profound. Like it literally changes your idea of yourself that you've been told since you were a child 
right? And so it's a lot of deconditioning and it's a lot of confrontation. And you also feel, because it's very normal for us to think about the 3D world and the institutions of power, which is what we're going to talk about with Pluto, because Pluto and Capricorn especially rule over power and systems. And when we think about power systems, we immediately think, oh, there's corruption there. There's inorganic timelines. There's there's things that aren't actually for the highest good of humanity present. But when we think of spiritual practices and spiritual tools, it's very dysregulating and um, betrayal evoking to actually consider that our tools for liberation and awakening and spirituality could also be corrupted. It's incredible. And of course, it makes sense that it is because they've been power tools like astrology was really used in its height during the Roman Empire. They used it to deify their Caesars, to plan their wars. Some Caesars even killed people based on their astrology chart alone. Could you imagine astro assassination? Like that was happening at that time period. They had Capricorn on their coins if they were Capricorns. Like it was, it was used. I was there during that time in another lifetime. And even then I was fighting for people being able to know the truth of the sky but the Roman Caesars, the power system, wanted to keep that information for themselves. And so they fixed the Western timeline into what it is so that they could control the masses and that they could have the information so that you they could use it for their own power, manipulation, and control, right? I don't know if you've ever seen that quote of like, millionaires don't use astrology, billionaires do, because it's a part of like the power system. When you know how the cosmic cycles of the earth change, you can predict market shifts. You can predict major changes. We're about to have massive changes for the next 17 years as Pluto goes into Capricorn. And it's incredibly powerful knowledge. And I believe it's something that we all have a birthright to. We are literally born on this planet looking at the heavens with an ability to see with our own eyes for a purpose. And I think that this is really the time and it's in space where we get to learn this, but it's incredibly uncomfortable. It brings up, and it's and it's kind of ironic because it's exactly what we're asking, you know, the normies, the muggles of the world to wake up to, is to wake up to the destruction and the corruption in the systems, yet we ourselves might be blind to the corruption within the systems that we use ourselves. And that's very uncomfortable. That's a hard pill to swallow. That's a black pill. And but the golden pill that actually is immediately an antidote to it is that the truth is right there and it's visible and it's available for all to see and it's free and no one can take it away from you. Once you spot Jupiter and you can see where Jupiter is in the sky, you can orient yourself to the highest expansive timeline available to you and feel that sense of expansion and you know where the sun and the light codes are coming from. Like no one can take that away from you. No astrologer can have the information or the intel more than your own body does. So it's really, really powerful to connect to. I absolutely love that. And I, that's the main thing that I have been really encouraging people to do is to understand that you have an organic personal relationship with the stars and you get to cultivate your own body's organic relationship with the earth energies as well. And this is the stuff that our ancestors have done for so long, connecting to the earth, seeing how the stars have its impact and shifts in the energies of the earth to the point where we're building, you know, stone circles in certain times and we're amplifying these energies is really this co-creation, this song, this dance, when we are in harmonic union with the organic reality. And so somebody in the chat was saying, how is, you know, the Western astrology being used to manipulate and control? And for me, it comes down to our consciousness and what it really is. Um, in the, in, you know, the mainstream, in the mass culture, we think that consciousness is just the human mind, is what we think and our ideas and how we perceive reality and things like that. But our consciousness is so much more than that. Our soul has the ability to connect through time and into our past lives, into other star systems, to communicate with our star ancestors. And so this is how we activate this greater octave of our mind's intelligence to move beyond the solar system, right, where we have that matrix prison in the solar level. And so when we have something like a 
you know, oftentimes people say, oh, you know, tropical astrology is there because it's math. We've created a system and it's the same and it's telling a story. And for me, that's never been a valid really argument because it tells me that that system is a projection of the human mind that's not actually coherent or harmonized with the natural world. So what that means is that we're existing inside of a mental construct, which if everyone agrees to the mental construct, then is reality, right? If everybody agrees that we get all our groceries from the grocery store and we pay our taxes and we're good little slaves, if we all buy into that reality, then that is the reality. So it's the same thing in, in astrology where we have this mental construct of what is the night sky or the cosmos, but what it's really doing is blocking us from having an organic and personal relationship with the stars. And that's almost the most important thing. What Sonia was saying is like looking up at the sky, feeling it in your own body, having a personal relationship with something that's not just a mental construct, but actually something that is organic to the physical reality. And that's really something that I'm so passionate about because we're talking about the Earth's grids and the star maps. And the star maps are just this holographic greater dimension of the Earth's grids. And so what we're really doing is realigning ourselves to organic time and organic structure. And somebody mm -hmm. was saying, well, astrology don't matter because there's no such thing as time. And I think that's just new age bogus because obviously, you know, we can say there's no such thing as time, but I, I had my day planned out and I'm making progress in life and I'm experiencing the movement of matter, which is what we experience as time. So I think that physicality mm -hmm. in the false matrix we might have this distorted idea of time but ultimately in the cosmos everything is moving and evolving and transforming and it's time mm -hmm. that is allowing matter to move forward in that way mm -hmm. mm. yeah it's so powerful there's mm, there's so much i want to say <laughs> where to even start um yeah, I feel like I need a prompt. <laughs> well, okay, let's go into um, Capricorn because, you know, we were talking about how Capricorn is really a dragon. And mm -hmm. you know, for me, when I think, when I thought about Capricorn previously, the last thing that I would think about Capricorn is that it's a dragon. Like I thought Capricorn, my mother is a Capricorn. Like I thought they're kind of boring and they're so grounded and all of those things. Um so like what, what is Capricorn energy really? And why does it make sense that Pluto is actually going into Capricorn? Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. So Capricorn being a dragon is a remembering that came from my sacred soul sister, Cassidy Lee Bell, who's also one of my favorite true sky astrologers and 13 moon ceremonious ceremonialist keepers and her and I teach together inside of my cosmic arts training where we did a whole training and transmission about Capricorn and when you really look at the sea goat that is Capricorn and has a little beard it has a tail really it looks like a water dragon like when you really look at it like it's got these arms these right it looks like a dragon so really when you think of like a sea goat that's a very strange mythological rich mythological creature which has been around since ancient Sumer um, you know, the ancient Sumerian gods had little sea goats as pets, like instead of dogs, they had fun little sea goats, which is quite cute. But I think that connecting to the dragon, which is a mythical being, which is in almost every culture around the earth is a dragon. And especially in the earth keepers that are very connected to the lunar cycles, to the cosmic cycles, it is very present. And Capricorn being a dragon, being an earth sign, it is an earth keeper. It is the keeper of the earth grids. It is the holder of the connection to the tectonic plates, to the melding of the molten lava, and then the the beautiful earth plane that we see above us. And they are really the ones that hold all of these different elements of the earth, all of these different expressions of earth. And they're really here to contain the earth and protect the earth and protect the people of the earth. And many Capricorns feel this immense, um, this immense indebtedness and even this commitment and this 
fire and drive within them to do work that will leave a legacy for the earth, that will leave the earth a better place. And they are so committed and so integrous in doing that sort of work because they have this dragon mythical energy within them. And they're definitely not boring. Like I would say out of all the earth signs, like Capricorn is the most mythical, is the most poetic, is the one that really is both earth and fire or water, I mean, and fire being the dragon element, right? So they really are this transmutational being that can hold a lot of different al alchemical power within them. And that being the sign and the structure, you know, typically ruled over by Saturn, it represents power. It represents our relationship to time. It represents our relationship to systems of power, to institutions, to rules, to control all of that. And so you can, I mean, you can't see Pluto because she's small, she bitty, um, she tiny. She was reduced down to a dwarf planet, which is still a planet, but I consider Pluto as a planet. That's just my Scorpio placements though, because she's my ruler. So I'm very connected to Pluto and we all get to have our own relationship. I just think that there's going to be more planets to find and calling them dwarf planets. I don't know, just kind of they're littler planets, right? It's kind of like you don't call people that anymore. You call them little people. So I think we need to call them little planets. Instead. It's certainly not a dwarf energy. No, definitely not. Like it packs such a potent punch. And the thing about Pluto mixing with Capricorn. So literally we're three days away from Pluto going into Capricorn. You can see this if you look at any astronomy app. Like I said, Starwalk 2 is my favorite. You can also see this. Often true sky astrology is also known as true sidereal astrology in terms of the astrological systems. Um, I think that it's kind of funny that you have to call it true. Like it's like, oh, this is true, which is hilarious to me. Um, but you can also find it on masteringthezodiac.com, true sidereal astrology. You can pull up charts there. And you can also see that on the 26th, Pluto will be over the line and into Capricorn. And it will be there for the next 17 years until 2040. And what's really interesting is February being our only natural lunar month that we have in our fake Gregorian calendar. Although some of you might follow lunar calendars, like the Chinese calendar, or the Hebrew calendar, or indigenous moon calendars. There's lots of people on the planet following natural cosmic calendars. Um, ours just isn't in our Gregorian calendar of 2024. But um, it's our natural lunar month that has 28, in this case, 29 days. So it follows a lunar calendar month. And it's always in February that Pluto seems to shift signs. Back in 2007, it shifted into Sagittarius. So if you think back to 2007, where you were, what you were doing, and what you've been doing since 2007 until now a lot of things changed in the world, like literally technology, mobile phones, tablets, the internet, Wi-Fi, all of it really exploded and expanded since that time. And now we're going into Capricorn Pluto energy, which means that I'm very excited for it. I can hardly contain myself, but it means that the power structures that we know, that we love, that we dislike, that we hate, all that we know in terms of government, institution, medical system, school system, um, pretty much everything that is an institution on the planet will be transformed, reborn, and completely repurposed. It doesn't mean it's all going to burn down. It means that what's good will remain and what is corrupt and not healthy has to be changed. That's what Pluto does. It rebirths. Right over the past 17 years since Pluto has been in Sagittarius, has it been 17 years? Yeah, 2007 to 2024. No, is that longer? That's like 20 something years. Am I wrong? No, it's 17. <laughs> okay, sorry, my math is off. Um, so since Pluto has been in Sagittarius, which is now leaving, we have literally had the ability to do what we do now. We have literally had this ability to connect to each other instantaneously all around the world to share information, to share, share transmissions, to give each other information, which is so, so, so powerful and profound for all of us to have. And it wouldn't have happened without Pluto going through that expansiveness in Sagittarius. This is also the time when most of the teachers woke up, when all of us 
got clear on our missions on the planet. When the inner guru within us awakened, expanded, learned, went to all the places we needed to go to on the earth to develop our gifts. And now we're really solidifying into what our legacy is going to be that we're going to leave on the planet for the future generations to come, which is what Capricorn energy is all about. It is a guardian energy. It is the father archetype in the cosmos opposing cancer, which is the mother archetype. And so that father wants to provide, wants to protect, wants to leave a beautiful legacy for the world and for the children of the world. And over the next 17 years, we will be anchoring that in for ourselves individually, but we're also going to be anchoring that in collectively, literally 20 years from now, we might be laughing at, the, hopefully at the fact that we used to have corruption in government that we used to have war that was gained from and that was profitized from through the military industrial complex. We're going to laugh at the fact that we had like gross corporate greed intermeshed with our civil service and our public human rights. And it's just going to be a very, very different system once Pluto actually goes into Aquarius. Because to me, Pluto in Aquarius is like, oh, it's time for real humanitarian service to reign on the planet and everything else that needs to change in order for that to be the case is what's happening. A lot of people who think that Pluto is in Aquarius right now, which is the Western false timeline, think that it's like AI and all the technology. And that's not what's happening. That's not the world we're going into right now. We're going into power transformation mode where the hands, where the people in power are going to be shifting quite significantly. And the power structures that we have in place are going to be transforming and rebirthing themselves so that they're actually of the earth for the earth, for the people of the earth. Yeah. That is just so exciting and so resonant with me because obviously it's the dragon year this year. And what has been coming through so much are these original dragon scrolls, right? The dragons are the keepers of high consciousness civilizations. And so there's a blueprint, there's an original state for the highest civilizations. In these high civilizations, there's a way for us to um, have medicine systems. There's a way for us to educate children. All of these institutions are based on very high consciousness virtues and values and understanding of spirituality and life. And so understanding that this is a Capricorn of the dragon energy and Pluto is rebirthing these foundational structures of reality makes utter and complete sense. Obviously, it's what as far as having heaven on earth and having, you know, what is all the light workers even working towards, right? We're here to rebirth these systems of reality. And I feel like this is the grounding energy that so many of the light workers really, really need because I feel like, you know, you're right in that this Pluto in Aquarius energy is very mental. It's very heady. It's like we're heading in that direction. And there's nothing we can do about it. Like this is like what is happening. Technology is advancing really fast. And it feels like this really ungrounded energy that has nothing to do with what the humans are actually doing with this cosmic energy on the ground, which when you really think about it, this aligns with like the work of your star Academy and all the light workers here on earth. Like we're here to build new systems on the ground, new monetary systems, new education systems, new medical systems. These are the things that are going to start to happen in a physical way in this reality. So many people are already going out, you know, into different countries and starting new communities and living bringing back these original dragon squirrels. But these dragon squirrels, again, we're talking about a conscious planetary civilization and how conscious civilizations actually structure these aspects of society, right? And so in order for that heaven on earth to truly happen on the earth in the third dimension, this is really what we're going to see in the next 17 years, hopefully, right? This is what we want to be seeing is people taking this Capricorn energy, rebirthing these systems so that life on earth looks different for everyone by the end of it. And I think that this is a very supportive and positive and excellent and aligned energy. It makes total sense um, on that front. <laughs> mm, it's powerful. And it's also very uncomfortable, like having our sense of power rocked and shook up and, and, you know, in order for rebirth to happen, there also needs to be death. So there will be parts of the system that do die away. And 
know, the same as in a forest fire or even a hurricane, they can be, they're very regulating, although destructive to the environment, right? They kill away all the disease. They re-regulate the water temperature, um, a hurricane does. And then the fires like will kill the disease and create new life and regeneration to the soil and to the forest. But obviously there needs to be death and changeover. And, you know, many people have said like that this will be the time when we see like, um, like arrests of the like over overlords, the Kabbalian overlords of the world and of the governments, and there will be exposure. And it won't be something that only a select few people who are very inquisitive and very in the know, know about. There will be like, oh, wow, we used to have rampant corruption throughout all of our governments and power structures. Isn't that crazy that that's how we functioned? And literally, like, it's such an irony that the most corrupt part of our society is what's here to be of public service and servanthood to the public. And it's like all of these ironies that exist in, in our system right now will be done away with and we will have profound transformation and technology will actually serve us in doing that right what if we couldn't have like corporate corruption or greed or lobbying because like blockchain was used to actually control where our tax funds went and et cetera, et cetera. I, I have lots of ideas and musings and downloads that I've gotten and received around what this can look like I don't know exactly I just know that it's going to be profound. Like even with that Putin interview that happened earlier this month, I was like, oh, here we go. Like Pluto hasn't even entered Capricorn and it's already starting like new dialogue, new conversations, new information, um, just like a real opening up and using everything that we've gained from Sagittarius Pluto, which is technology and this ability to connect instantaneously with each other on all of these platforms is going to be a way for everyone to really proliferate um, the spread of, of goodness in the world. Um, okay. So I, I really want to ask about like what, just a little forecast is like, if we're not moving into Aquarius now, like what is that going to look like when we eventually do move into Aquarius? What does that look like in the organic? But before we um, go into that, there was one thing that one thing more I wanted to share that's very interesting is that you know, since I'm not an astrologer, right? Like before I really met Sonia, like I wasn't really in this world. But then when I met her, I was like, oh my God, like this is so cool. I just want to talk about it. But what I did not realize that is that astrology is like this whole thing. And I, I just like came in the scene and started stepping on toes and like people started, you know, yelling at me and, <laughs> and calling me all sorts of names. And just, it was like not a civil conversation often all the times. And then I started, you know, my friends would send me these videos of people like making fun of True Sky and just, you know, talking about it, dissing it, and even going as far as like making fun of people's like face, like, you know, making fun of people's teeth, making fun of people as people instead of addressing what they're saying. And it's this like ugly side of like the human unconscious that's very ironic to me because mm -hmm. I feel like when you step into organic intelligence is this benevolence and this kindness like I could never imagine myself like laughing at somebody's face or making a random diss at them just because I don't agree with something that they believe in or something like that just seems like such a a, a lower epoch or like past timeline kind of behavior and that's the kind of behavior that I'm often seeing in some of these people that are just heavily defending tropical astrology and I just thought that was very interesting that like as a scientist I'm just like seeing frequencies and consciousness and seeing that there are certain people that would never treat other people in that way there are certain people that would never like there's just such an organic benevolence that we just want to help people have fun we just want to help people see the beauty of life like that's what we're here for and then there are people that are just like committed to staying into a narrative and they'll just be really mean to people about it. And I'm sure we've all seen that play out in different parts of the reality, but I just thought that was such an interesting thing to take notice. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's wild. Um, and the true sky astrologers have gotten really fierce since the last full moon, since the cancer full moon last month. And tomorrow we have the Leo full moon. 
in reality, which is potent. So our leadership and ability is being potently activated right now. And with the last full moon, I noticed every true sky astrologer I follow, we've been really nice and we are very nice and kind because we're like, okay, like you don't believe me, just go look for yourself. Like literally just look up. Like you don't need me to be an expert. Use your own eyes and tell me what you think. Like look for yourself. And um, we've recently been, we've been very like, okay, do your Western astrology. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. But lately we've been actually a lot more passionate around, especially with Pluto, like getting people to recognize that it is a false, it's like VR in terms of astrology, right? If you follow Western astrology, it's like you have a VR headset on and you're like, I'm looking at the sky. That's such a Instead good analogy. Going and looking at the sky. That's, <laughs> like that's really, literally that's what it is. Saying that's a really good analogy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was trying to explain it to my one friend who's like still very, because a lot of people are like, well, there's a timeline, there's a resonance. Of course, there's a timeline and resonance. There's literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people adding to the frequency, to the thought form that is Western astrology. And that's exactly what the Romans wanted. It's a spell. It's a spell of mass spiritual mind control. And it's so disturbing when you actually like feel into that nefarious nature of what it is. And a lot of people don't want to admit that, right? Can you imagine the masses being able to understand what just happened over the last four years, right? We're in a leap year again. We're about to approach March. We're about to approach four years since everything really started shifting on the planet. Could you imagine if they actually were to face that? It's incredibly life altering. It's incredibly traumatic. It's a lot to be with and not everyone can be with a black pill like that. I know for me, it almost took me out. I needed marijuana to like help me stabilize and then I became addicted to it and I've been one year sober of marijuana. I'm very proud of myself. I'm sober lady. You were a tropical astrologer before this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I first became an astrologer, I was a tropical astrologer because it's really all I knew. And then I learned about sidereal and Vedic and then I would kind of teach both and then, and then one day. I was just looking at the moon and I thought, let's look at my astronomy app and see where the moon is. And I looked at the moon and it said it wasn't, and it showed me, it didn't say, it didn't say, it showed me it was in cancer and I could see that it was in cancer. And I thought, that's weird. My app told me it was in Leo. And I'm like, what? And then I look around and I'm like, oh, look, beside cancer is Leo, beside Leo is Virgo. And look, it all goes into the procession that it is. And I'm like, oh, I can just observe this with my own eyes. And it just shifted for me. And then I remembered um, what, I, what I've known for lifetimes is the truth of the sky and to actually follow the cosmos with your own eyes. And it's a very, very powerful lesson to, rem to remember. Um, yeah. So with that all being said, what there is to expect, I mean, it's a ways away, like 2040, like literally 2040, 17 years from now is when Pluto will actually enter Aquarius. It will be in the Aquarius Capricorn cusp a little bit before that. So there's going to be kind of like a grace period, a cuspy period that we'll have to integrate with, but it'll be purely in the stars of Aquarius come February, March. 2040. And once it's in that star space, I believe that it will be the time for like deep humanitarian shifts. Like it will be like really the next 17 years are like, let's end the corruption. Let's make it so the power systems aren't actually like abusing power, which is what they do, which is like an, an oxymoron. Like let's remove the oxymoronic non-integrous nature of our power systems and make them true power systems. And then when we get into Aquarius, it's let's actually serve humanity on the highest level that we can and let everyone be a unique individual as they are, love who they want, live where they want. It's going to be a really radical and transformative time, like even more so than Pluto and Capricorn. But first we need Pluto and Capricorn to clear out the BS. And some people that follow Western astrology it's like they've been even, I've been even reading in their comments. They're like, oh, I kind of expected more to happen during Pluto and Capricorn. And I'm like, yeah, because it hasn't even started yet. Like that's why it hasn't happened yet. Right. Um, 
like there's no way that Pluto and Capricorn would have meant like technological ramping up and the mass adoption of social media and glo and mobile devices and everything like that. Like Facebook started in 06 and Saturn, I mean, Pluto went to Sagittarius in 07. So it's really like, that's what this has been about. And Sagittarius is all about expansion of information, connection, learning, being able to grow, being able to connect to all places all around the world and us being able to travel all around the world. And that's really what we saw the proliferation of is people traveling and working all around the world. I mean, you're in Costa Rica. I'm going to be travel like I travel around and work all the time. And that's what we saw the proliferation of. And next, we're going to see a deep, profound shift of how we relate to the earth and how we relate to the earth and our power systems that provide for the earth, provide for the humans of the earth, and how we actually need to change all of the rules so that they actually are helpful and supportive to humanity without it being like, it's not about anarchy or chaos to get there. It's about... Um, like a structured flow. Like it's actually going to be funny because it'll be the systems that were created that actually take down the people that created them. It's going to be like, they will be tried and persecuted within their own laws, which is great in my opinion. <laughs> that all makes total and complete sense. And I am just truly excited for that. And I think that's why this particular energy, like for me, I'm I'm really interested in the parts of astrology that like serve my work and, and inspires things that I'm already inspired about. I'm feeling these dragon scrolls starting to return and really understanding that the dragons teach humans how to have advanced civilizations, essentially, right? That is like our 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 guides and our teachers, their role is to help humanity align to our original values and to create advanced human civilization based on those true values. And that is exactly what Capricorn energy really is in the highest level, is divine right order, right? That Holy Father, divine right order. If everything is actually in accordance to divine law, we would have an advanced human civilization that was built on the virtues of unconditional love and acceptance and co-creation and all of those beautiful things that, you know, we're working on installing into the fabric and the foundation of society. So that's essentially the thing that really made sense to me about Pluto going into Capricorn, because as you said, I definitely didn't really feel that that much over the last 17 years. You know, that's just we the, the, the rebirthing the rebirthing energy of the system of the earth has not been really focused on that. You know, we've seen a lot of hunkering down of these system. It's been that the system, the, the old distorted system has been trying to tyrannically exert itself very heavily over the last, you know, especially over the last four years, I feel like they've really amplified that effort in cementing this kind of societal structure. And so knowing that Pluto is now moving to Capricorn and coming into rebirth, those foundational systems of politics, of medicine, of education, of money, you know, that's actually really, really, really aligned and really exciting. It is exciting. Like we are, we are so lucky to be here at this time. Like there is no coincidence we chose to be here on the earth at this time as mission keepers, as leaders. And this is really our time to shine. You know, someone just said like, Pluto and Capricorn is about work and heck yeah, it is like, it's time for us to really get to work. Like Pluto and Sagittarius was our collective time to expand ourselves, to grow ourselves, to learn what we needed to learn, right. To start with yoga and then expand into the cosmos, however your spiritual journey has gone. But now it's time to really put that work into work. And some of us might actually be drawn to doing work in the institutions. I even feel drawn to going back into corporate settings so that I can spread spread the good in those areas. Whereas it's somewhere where I wanted to get away because it was so corrupt. And now I'm like, oh, I have to actually go and change it from the inside out. Oh, and we're talking some about like the creating of worldwide epic scaled companies. And this is like all, I feel like this is where Sonia and I like jive so much because for me, like I'm all about dreaming big. Like, oh, you have a problem with the medical system? Just go create a different one. You have a problem with the foster care system? Go create a different one. Like we are these 
epic, cosmic, powerful creator beings. Like if they can create this planetary matrix, we can create something better, right? Mm -hmm. And so understanding how these systems can either encourage that kind of thinking, that kind of expansion or limit it is really important because I feel like at the end of the day, it's like when we ingest nutrients in the form of information, is it junk food or is it actually nutritious? And so for me, I really focus on creating content and knowledge that really inspires people to imagine their greatest self and just focus on their destiny and really to create that future that they know can be possible. So if you have a problem with any part of this reality, this is the time to hunker down and focus on one thing and really leave behind the legacy that your soul is here to leave behind. And that includes, you know, creating large companies that facilitate service and upliftment and joy and co-creativity for human beings and the whole planet, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be really profound. And like I said, like there's, there's so much to be optimistic about. There's so much to be excited about because you know, we're never going to see this cosmic cycle happen again. Pluto moves so slowly. We only really see like three or four Pluto shifts during our lifetime. And we won't be around for another Pluto and Capricorn shift. But we definitely need it at this point in time in society, in humanity. And I just got, I just got a brainwave of like, oh, Pluto and Aquarius, like, aliens <laughs> like it's gonna be the time for like alien power <laughs> so much total sense to me i had mm -hmm. this weird vision i was at the grocery store in new mexico one time and i was like standing outside the grocery store waiting for my friends to be finished inside and then this car drives by and for a moment i look at the driver and it looked like me but I looked like I was like 40 or 50 years old. And it was so trippy because I, I just saw it's like almost like I, I quantum tunneled into myself when I'm 40 or 50. And I was working with some sort of new galactic UN that has nothing to do with the current UN. But it's like this peace council of mm -hmm. channelers and guardians that were supporting the world government and healing and creating a galactic civilization on earth. And I don't mm -hmm. know, you know, if I was to count the years, I looked like I was maybe 45, 50 years old. So that would, you know, fall into when Pluto goes into Aquarius. Um, and that energy feels totally correct because we need the right foundation, right? Even when we talk about mm -hmm. our personal ascension, we focus on, you know, our diet and our, our schedule and our habits. What time are we going to sleep? And we're healing our emotions and taking care of these foundational things, our family unit. And when we have that solid grounded foundation in our lower chakras, that's when we can really expand and have this higher, you know, galactic consciousness. And right now humanity is not set up for that kind of expansion right? Mm -hmm. We can't skip steps. We got to create the sustainable systems. And that's why it makes so much sense for us to go through these years in Capricorn and then bring in these, you know, galactic centers that we've all been seeing where contact is going to happen and galactic mm -hmm. you know, consciousness is going to be made more massively available and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there will be, you know, I think first we create peace on earth and then it's like peace throughout the universe, peace throughout all of the galaxies and with, that, with all other forms of life and divine consciousness and intelligence throughout the universe. And I don't think we're ready for it. And given all the misinformation and psyops and things and all the fear mongering around aliens and UFOs, you know, mm -hmm. that's just a distraction. That's also a part of that false Pluto Aquarius timeline. It's also the false like age of Aquarius that many like you know, spiritual leaders are talking about that this is the age of Aquarius when it's not happening really for another 300 years when the equinox is actually in Aquarius. And that's only one of the equinox points that in the north, the other equinox point is going to be in, um, I, uh, no, where is this squares? Why am I? Leo, um, for the south. So it's going to be really interesting. It's going to be a really interesting time to live through over the next 17 years. And then the 17 years after will be so profound. Like I actually see it as for all of us that were born during Pluto and Libra, 
it's our collective mission to to create peace on earth and the pluto and libra generation wasn't as long because pluto because libra is a much smaller constellation um it's from november 1988 until october 96 so 88 to 96 approximately and all of us that were born during that time, we have a mission to create peace on earth. That is what we came here collectively to do in our own unique individual ways. And this is a part of it, having, you know, our institutions and our systems of power in the world become sources of true power, true benevolent power powered by love let's say rather than by greed which is what they're currently mostly powered by um it will be a really really profound shift and that's what i really foresee there's also going to be a lot of discomfort like there will be massive shifts and change over like whatever is corrupt and um inorganic will be erased from our systems of power. And that can look like crashes and burns and changes and changeover, but it doesn't necessarily mean like war and civil war and, you know, all the fear mongering. Like I think all the people out there fear mongering are just like, adding... yeah. <laughs> what was, what did you call them? Like twilight? dancers or twilight, <laughs> twilight masters hmm. yeah well, shane and i just like to laugh it off and say that they're bored because like when you when you have a purpose like when your true soul's purpose is activated in your heart like you don't have time to talk shit about other people you don't have time to judge other people you don't have time to fear monger you're like in the stream where you're creating co-creating with god and you're just having too much fun being yourself you know and so anytime i see people are focused on just pointing out you know misinformation agents over here and war is going on over there it's like they're bored they're not you know doing what they're supposed to be doing doing. Um, and ultimately, I feel like that's just really sad because I really do believe that every human being has a purpose, has a destiny and could be, you know, embodying greatness if they set their own heart to it. And ultimately, that's the thing that brings the most joy and fulfillment to the soul that's having this human experience. Um, but anyway, Sonia, we're just at this hour mark here. And I have one question. <laughs> one final question because I know that people are asking this. So what is the primary difference between sidereal and true sky? And then also, what is this 13th sign? And is it a possibility that there's a different name for it? Whoa, okay. All right, so sidereal astrology is based on, it says it's based on the fixed stars and the fixed stars are really the stars that are in the sky. They're actually not fixed because the stars move one degree every 72 years, um, which is called the precession of the equinoxes. So the stars are moving very slowly, but in our lifetime, like it moves one degree every 72 years, there's 360 degrees. Like we're not going to really see that shift in our human lifetime. Um, but the thing about sidereal astrology is it's, it's, it's a, a closer approximation to what is happening, but it still oversimplifies the sky in that it only makes each of the signs 30 degrees. So it makes them all equal length, equal size. And it also excludes the 13th sign of the Zodiac, which actually, actually it's the ninth sign. It just makes them all collective 13. Pisces becomes the 13th, um, which is Ophiuchus, Ophicus, Ophiuchus. <laughs> Lots of different ways to say some people are very feisty against this 13th sign. Like they scoff at it. And like, I've actually never really, I mean, I've heard about it, like, you know, just this little whisper. And then, you know, we found out in our reading that my midheaven was actually in the sign. And when mm -hmm. Sonia explained that, like, it's about shamanic arts and really bringing healing from just this higher dimension. I mean, you guys know that, like, there's no better way to describe my work than that. And so obviously there's something there. And then there was another sister in our community that was saying something about how like a fucus is like an overlay, like the name of it or something. And so I just was, it just mm. made me like question or think about it because uh, maybe there's some connection with the divine mother or something or other. <laughs> mm. Well, 
So the the ninth sign of the zodiac, because it's between Scorpio and Sagittarius, and it actually shares a lot of the sky with Scorpio. So for, from November 29th until about December 6th, it's dancing with the stars of both Scorpio and Nophiacus. It's both of their signs. And it is the sign that has been occulted, that has been tabooed, that has been rightfully hidden and removed very precisely surgically removed from the collective divine intelligence and cosmic understanding. And the purpose for this is, is because Ophiuchus is an incredibly powerful sign. Some people even say that I disagree with, say that it's kind of like Kundalini because it does represent the serpent dancer and that it's so powerful and it's such an activating energy to be aware of that it can be dangerous and how powerful and activating it is. However, I feel like if you're learning about it and you're in its frequency, it's your time, right? People that are not ready for it will be repelled, will be blocked from really receiving its divine cosmic natural healer mode. And it is a master healer. The, the mysticism of Ophiuchus is that it was such a powerful healer. It, it could resurrect from the dead. And so they were killed by Hades in the Greek myths or by Zeus because Hades wanted more dead souls in the underworld. And so this master healer that could literally heal to the point of resurrecting from the dead was killed. So there's these incredible healing codes. And what you'll notice during Ophiuchus season every year, I've observed it for three years now, is that your deepest level of healing and profound womb recon wound reconciliation happens during this time. And usually you're drawn to the healers and to the support systems that you need. However, the healing doesn't look the way that like I see in Virgo healing looks. It looks a lot more mystical. It looks a lot more magical. It's a lot more artful. And it often has to do with music, sound, vibration, and dance, right? How healing dancing is, how healing music is, how healing dancing and music together combined are for the human soul, for the human spirit, and how transformational, how transmutational that is, and how expressive we can be, how much we can say with song that we wouldn't dare say with just our words alone. And so it's an incredibly powerful sign. People that have it, I've read for a lot of Ophiuchuses since I became a true sky astrologer, a 13 sign astrologer. And I don't know about the name piece. I mean, really, if I wanted to blow it all up, I would be willing to say that um, I'm not sure exactly what our words were for the constellations during Atlantean times or Lumerian times, but since Sumer, they have been kind of the fixed 12. And Ophiuchus really comes from like the Greek word. Um, I also think, well, Cassidy, my beautiful sister, she thinks that like Ophia, like Sophia, it's like a, the divine Sophia being expressed to the world um, in its feminine creative nature. Well, I know that's why they took it out, right? Why they erased it. Because I mean, Divine Mother, Mary Magdalene, there's been this entire agenda to remove that consciousness from society. So that makes total sense. Um, people are asking like when Ophiuchus season is during the year. Yeah, so it's November 29th until December 19th. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so fun and exciting. If you want a reading, Sonia is the woman. I actually, when I first brought the reading up to my husband, I booked him a session and he was like so skeptical, right? I mean, I bet he he's so inquisitive though. He probably asked you just like a whole bunch of questions. And um, in the end, I mean, I, Sonia just delivered such an amazing reading. So like if you are on the fence, if you are really connected to your tropical chart, just still go get the reading. Like, that's what I just suggested. Like, why wouldn't you just want the data and then, you know, decide for yourself after that. So you can, um, I dropped the links in the description and on Instagram, she is at Sonia, S-A-N-J-A. -A. You can message her, you can book a session. I highly recommend it because my session was absolutely incredible. And then Shane had an incredible session that he went back for a second one. Um, and so, and, and, you know, Shane is so, uh, you know, sensitive, like informationally. So I feel like just, you know, the fact that Sonia impressed even my husband 
was a sign of her greatness. <laughs> mm, I'm so grateful. It was really powerful reading for him because his mission was so potent and I had like such a stream of information to give him. And he actually didn't ask me a lot of questions. I just told him a bunch of things yeah. and then he told me a lot of things in return. And he, and I was like, dude, like you're talking to me about your deepest like imaginings and gifts and mission. And that's because mm -hmm. I can see it mm -hmm. in your heart. And what's incredible is when I'm reading, I'm really reading for you. It's your own, it's almost like your own soul's cosmic intelligence is just streaming through me. And I'm, I'm the channel, I'm the conduit that's able to give you that information. And then after I read, I don't remember anything. Like, I don't remember a thing about oh, what I said. Like the work of a star oracle, like which is the interesting thing, right? Like I feel like that's what distinguishes like an, an oracle or an actual astrologer versus like a somebody that is just reading out of the book that has like studied. Because sometimes I get this energy, like one time somebody's like, I studied at this, the most prestigious, you know, astrology school. And so I know all this stuff about astrology. And it's like, well, can you read souls? Can you tune into organic intelligence? Because if you can't channel then like math doesn't say anything about a person's chart. Because again, it's the soul that creates the chart and not the other way around. And I feel like mm. that's part of the soul prison as well, to think that like we are our product of our chart. We're a product of, you know, circumstance and our, we're a product of bi biology and physicality and not the other way around where our soul is actually navigating and artistically crafting our physical experience and the one that's designing our chart and not the other way around. Um, something else that blew me away was also our reading. I got my baby reading. I got Kara a reading. And Sonia knew nothing about my journey with Kara. And she was telling me all sorts of crazy stuff. I was like, oh, my God, how do you know? How do you know? Because she was just, you know, tapped in. And so this is kind of a organic experience. You know, I am just so picky with the people that I allow to read me. And now I have this just crew of really awesome you know, a Kosh reader, we've got an Akash reader, we've got a galactic astrology reader, Graham, who's amazing. And um, last last uh, December, we made a galactic astrology calendar with Graham. Um, if you want, I've launched this digital copy that you can get. But next year, Sonia is actually going to be coming on board and we're going to be working true sky alignments into the calendar as well. And we're going to be building a calendar, we're going to be building a planner, just to, again, like for me, none of this is about mental information. It's about your personal relationship with the stars. Like that's literally the most exciting thing is when you're tracking time. Because that's how it started for me, right? Just noticing energies and then realizing they happen every year. And then synchronicities about those energies would happen every single year. And I feel this personal soul connection with the stars. And I get shifted out of this mental prison, this mental projection of this false reality. And I get tapped back into the original, the organic, where I'm just having a living relationship myself internally between my organic body and the stars. And there's no greater feeling than that. This is a path that you can step onto to cultivate. It requires for you to pay attention and not just take things for face value, but really, as Sonia has been saying, like, look up at the stars, ask your body, how does it make you feel and track those energies so that you're really having a lived and it's, it's the same thing with God, right? Like, religion wants us to have this relationship where we can only talk to God through a priest, and we can only talk through to the stars through an astrologer. And what's happening now is that we're like, what, let's cultivate our own lived relationship with this greater force that we all have this organic relationship with. And the only way that we can cultivate that is by paying attention and really just having fun with it, you know, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. It's the proliferation, the true sovereignty, like cosmic soul star sovereignty over ourselves and our own experience. And you know, I've had like really prominent accounts like block me and delete me for not even being rude, for simply just being like Western astrology is a Roman spell and you can just look up at the sky and see for yourself. Like what they're mean to you, hey? They like they're just all out like you're a misinfo agent and you have bad teeth and you should go, you know, die. You don't know what you're talking about. It's like just this crazy vomit comes out and it's like whoa, like what is that consciousness? Like what is the level of consciousness that is 
willing mm -hmm. to segregate and pitchfork and express in that way, which is something that, you know, a truly high consciousness being would never, ever, ever do in mm -hmm. any, you know? Oh, exactly. It's, um, I just think it's funny because in 10 years time, like by the end of Pluto and Capricorn, everyone's just going to be aware of the true sky. Like it's not even the true sky. It's just the sky. Um, it's, it's literally the just food, the sky. It's the health food section of the grocery store, right? It's like, if mm -hmm. this is if the health, if this is health food, like what is the rest of the store? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, it's profound. Like I, I don't feel very fussed around it. Like I even had a sense that like, oh, some of the people that like diss me now, like they'll probably get a reading with me later because you know, the truth always comes out and it pisses people off at first. It confronts their sense of identity. It confronts their ego. It confronts their conditioning of what they've learned. And also it's Galileo very died in prison, you know? Mm, Whoa. Well. And no, there's not really, I mean, I guess there's still people that would deny the fact that the earth is not like in the center of the universe. But like at this point, most people have shifted their paradigm mentally. So. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and just like Marta said, like nothing substitutes personal experience. Like no one can take away what you know for yourself. And it's the same with like any sort of spiritual higher consciousness experience. You know, I can't meditate for you. And I can't have a relationship with the cosmos for you. You have a birthright to be connected to the cosmos, just like you're here to be connected to the sky. Or, or just like you're here to be connected to the earth, right? You have as much of a birthright to be connected to the heavenly bodies all around us as you do to be connected to the earth around you, beneath you, um, that you call home. And so it's a very... It's just a very profound and like you say, organic way to live. And it's it's really beautiful to be with the truth because there's so few things that are the truth, really. Like yeah. really that we can all agree is true. Um, and so, yeah. It's all hey, so this is because all the astrologers are banking on the old system and their business depends on it. And I feel like that's a huge part of it because mm -hmm. it is a very like if they built their whole empire and they have like that tens of thousands of followers and they have this mm -hmm. entire business built out. It's like, how can they backtrack? And now it's like they have to just like, you know, shut you up and like call you a disinfo agent just to like sustain their. What else yeah. does that sound like? What, do, what what other system of power of politics does that mimic? Well, it's so interesting because like one of the arguments is like, oh, I went to like this, you know, institute and I, I, I studied at a prestigious academy and that means I know better than you. And like none of your lived experiences mean anything because it's not what I know and what I learned from school. And it's like, wait, yeah, that also sounds very familiar to me, but you know. Mm-hmm. It's really like microcosm, macrocosm. I think that it's very interesting. And of course, they're like, I used to be a Western astrologer. And then eventually I was like, that's not real. I'm going to stop following it. And I actually didn't have readings for a while. And I actually even questioned if I wanted to do this work, if I wanted to be the one kind of triggering and pinpointing people and having them have these identity crises to come over to their true sky view of themselves, which is really a deep, your deepest remembering of who you are. It's not a projection. It's not an imagination. It's truly where the planets were and where the constellations were at the time that you were born. And so it's really profound. Like the fact that they're calling it misinformation is just like deeply ironic and hilarious. But I also think that if they're some of the same people that are out there being truthers about the government and about other things, so it's very interesting and ironic that they can see one thing and not the other. And I mean, if they can be willing to admit, hey, I was wrong. I didn't have all the facts. I said I was an expert in the stars, but I never looked up at the effing sky, which is crazy. Like, would you trust a doctor that had never touched a body? I don't think so. Don't trust an astrologer that isn't looking at the sky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean... It is, I, there, it's definitely, there's definitely 
something there though, right? Because like doc, the, most doctors really don't know what the body is. Well, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was anyway. saying two things at once. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, again, you know, this is really meant to be like a joyful experience. It's not really meant to get our like panties all up in a knot. Like if this is confronting and like difficult, then, um, you know, just like forget about it. It doesn't matter. You know, I'll still love you as a human being. I'll still respect you. Like I'll still have dinner with you. I'll still walk around and go for a hike. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't matter to me. Like I'm literally just out here having fun, you know, create a whole new world that's peaceful and joyful for everyone. There's nothing wrong. There's not literally nothing wrong that's going on. And I mean, I feel like it just reveals this mind virus, which is very difficult, you know, to like when we're just inundated by like mental hierarchy programs, as you think about like what drives people to pitchfork and witch hunt and go after people like that in previous ages is this same mind virus, right? And it's really not even their fault. It's like this virus that's infiltrated humanity and human beings. So it's not really about pitting people against each other and their ideologies. We just have to see that there are certain diseases that are deeply held within human consciousness right now that makes people take everything way too seriously and not take the right things seriously enough. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting, like what this time with Pluto is going to really reveal for us around like Pluto is also a deep truth teller. It will reveal the truth of what's possible. And um, it'll be really profound how much that shifts and it's going to be uncomfortable. But I think with this Pluto transition, it's actually going to be more easeful for people to be willing to like um, to actually transform and grow and mutate essentially as we say in human design like you have to let yourself transform mutate evolve as a human being and I think eventually you know there will be some politicians in the world not all of them but some of them will be like wow we were really wrong and our policies were bunk and we were corporately corrupted and this is what we're truly going to do and there's going to be reform and there's going to be western astrologers that admit the same thing and you know, the truth will prevail, um, but it's not always going to be seen by the greater public everywhere at once immediately. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, <clears throat> so um, in conclusion, is there anything else that you'd like to share with the audience before we close off mm. our riveting conversation? It was so fun. Um, so fun have this so I, I can't wait to get started on uh, working on our calendar because you know mm -hmm. it's just going to be so cool to have, like have something you know and you're tracking and you're writing your notes like that's the most important part is that you're having like you're looking at the stars because sometimes you don't even want too much information like I don't want to tell you guys like what the energies are supposed to feel like even you know I want you to just see that there's an alignment and like really feel in your own body what it feels like because that's what it's all about but anyway mm -hmm. yeah that's that's really my overall like gift of sovereignty to you is to start looking up at the sky, go out tonight, the moon will be full and you will be able to see it inside of the constellation of Leo. You'll actually be able to see the Big Dipper above. So it's going to be a really obvious constellation to point out. The Big Dipper is right above Leo. You'll be able to see the full moon. So you'll be able to observe the actual placement of the full moon with your own eyes and from that let it stream into your body let it let the codes of the heavens actually speak to you in your own unique way you get to have your own relationship to it and if you want to learn about wherever the rest of the planets are and how to learn the constellations then get an app an astronomy app like star walk too and just literally point it to the sky and it'll orient you and you'll you'll be able to really learn how to read the sky yourself um, if you want to dive even deeper, I do have a cosmic arts training, which is going until Scorpio season. So until November, um, November, yeah, November next year. And, um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a whole other Pluto transmission specifically about that. So you can find out more about that on my Instagram page or my true star systems page. 
And I'm just really grateful that you've all been open and we've had really fun dialogue and there's been such incredible wisdom in the comments shared and that you're all actually open and willing to look up and just experience the cosmos and the heavens for yourself because it is your birthright to do so. Love that so much. Don't let people gaslight you out of your own experience, which is just something that, you know, you're just going to start to recognize that there is a similar energy behind that kind of behavior that exists in other matrix systems, right? And it's like, if anyone ever tries to tell you that your experience, like, oh, you have like anxiety, that's just in your head. Like, oh, you have pain. Oh, that's just in your head. Like, oh, you think you're having a personal relationship with the stars? Like, that's not real, <laughs> you know, just to recognize how that all sounds and the, to, to see the frequency of it and, you know, really start to develop your own sensitivity and know that you have a living relationship with the energies of the world as a human being. That's what we're meant to have. We're meant to have a lived relationship with the ley lines and the power spots. Like we don't need somebody to tell us where they are because we can feel it with our body. If we start to reclaim that, you know, technology, reclaim our own body in that way. So really excited, you guys. I put the link to that cosmic arts training in the chat and all of Sonia's um, links are in the description as well. I'm super excited to have her on and I'm just really excited to see where all of this goes in the next coming years. You know, I'm really excited that I have met you in physical life because we're just going to see some incredible things unfold over the next decades all of us, we're going to see just incredible things unfold in the next decades. And I'm so excited to be here with you guys. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should do another transmission. Well, probably before that, but in 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. It was like, see, like all of these things have 17 years in advance. <laughs> Love it. Let's do it. Awesome. Okay. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Much love and we'll see you next time. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.